And this morning we're continuing our series on Kingdom Living. And as you see from the screen behind us, our, our title this morning is looking at the parable of workers in the vineyard. Now I'm sure you've, I'm sure you've heard people say, it's not fair. Anyone heard that statement? Yeah. When I, yeah, once or twice we say it, don't we? Uh, when our boys were much younger, we heard that quite a lot. Um, so when Fraser was naughty, which wasn't very often, <laughs> we would take uh, we would take away his Xbox, and we would stop him from playing his Xbox. That was his kind of punishment. When when Ross was naughty, which was sometimes, um, we would take away his phone. We would take away his phone for a little while. And if Scott was naughty, we would give him. He's pricking up his ears now. If Scott was naughty, we would give him jobs around the house. Oh. And when these different punishments were dished out, we would hear the statement, it's not fair. You know, Fraser would say, why are you not banning Scott from the Xbox? It's not fair. Ross would say, why are you not taking Fraser's phone off him? It's not fair. And Scott would say, why are you not getting Ross to do all these jobs around the house? It's not fair. And you know, there's a temptation to retort, life's not fair. You gotta get used to it. That's not a particularly helpful thing to say. And a few weeks ago, we were talking about how we need to come before Jesus like a little child, in humility and in trust. And we talked about that being like a child is not the same as being childish. And being childish is a belief that fair and equal are the same thing. And of course, we know that's not true. And my boys thought if, if I was not giving them exactly the same thing or treating them in exactly the same way, then I wasn't being fair. Now, in the parable or that we're going to look at this morning, there's an aspect of people saying, it's not fair. And so we're going to read this passage this morning. And uh, Ruthlin is going to come now and read uh, God's word to us this morning. So uh, it's Matthew chapter 20, verses 1 through 16. Uh, thanks very much, Ruthlin. I know you're not tall, so I've just popped it down. <laughs> Matthew chapter 20, verses 1 to 16. The parable of the workers in the vineyard. For the kingdom of heaven is like the landowner who went out early in the morning to hire workers from his vineyard. He agreed to pay them a denarius for a day and sent them into his vineyard. About nine in the morning, he went out and saw the others standing in a marketplace doing nothing. He told them, you also go to work in my vineyard and I will pay you whatever is right. So they went. He went out again about noon and about three in the afternoon and did the same thing. About five in the afternoon, he went out and found still others standing around. He asked them, why have you been standing here all day long doing nothing? Because no one has hired us, they answered. He said to them, you also go to work in my vineyard. When evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, Call the workers and pay them their wages, beginning with the last ones hired and going on to the first. The workers who were hired about five in the afternoon came and each received a denarius. So when, they, when those came who were hired first, they expected to receive more, but each of them also received a denarius. When they received it, they began to grumble against the landowner. These who were hired last worked only one hour, they said and you have made them equal to us who have borne the burden of the work and the heat of the day. But he answered one of them, I am not being unfair to you, friend. Didn't you agree to work for a denarius? Take your pay and go. I want to give the one who was hired last the same as I gave you. Don't I, don't I have the right to do what I want with my own money? Or are you envious of because I am generous? So the last will be the first and the first will be last. Thank you. Amen. May God add a blessing to the reading of his word. So to really get the full power of this parable, we have to look at a little bit of context. And that context is 
found in the preceding chapter, in chapter 19. A couple of things we need to notice in Matthew chapter 19. The first is something that we looked a little bit at a couple of weeks ago, is, is that when parents sought to bring their little children to Jesus, then uh, they were trying to get them to Jesus so that he could bless them, lay his hands on them and bless them. But the disciples rebuked them and stopped them from coming. But Jesus corrected his disciples and said, you know, as he said, let the little children come to me. Do not hinder them, for the kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these. And as we saw a few weeks ago, Jesus was telling his disciples and anyone else listening that it, we need to come to him like a child. The message is never stop coming to Jesus in humility and in trust because he loves that and he wants to bless that. The second thing we need to notice is the story of the rich young ruler. Now, he wanted to know what it was that he had to do to inherit eternal life. And Jesus responded by quoting some of the Ten Commandments and the, the young man said, well, I've kept all of these since I was a boy. That's how he responded. And, but Jesus said, one thing you lack, go and sell all you have and give to the poor. And the rich young ruler couldn't do that. And the Bible says he went away sad. Jesus then turned to his disciples and he pointed out how hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of heaven. And when Jesus said it's easier for a camel to get through the eye of a needle than for the rich to inherit the kingdom of God, the disciples were shocked. They were shocked. They said, who then can be saved? Who then can be saved? You see, in this rich young ruler is a young man who seems to have it all. It's a guy that seems to have it all. He's young, he's rich, he's got a great job, he's got respect in society. By all counts, he's following the commands of God. And in general terms, in those days, someone that was in that position was expected to get to heaven because of their righteousness. Poverty in those days was generally seen as a result of sin in people's lives. So if anyone deserved to get eternal life, it was this rich, young ruler. No wonder the disciples were shocked and said, who then can be saved? If this guy can't get to heaven, what hope is there for the rest of us? And Jesus simply says, with man this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. Peter then exclaims in response to this, We have left everything to follow you. What will be there for us? Now Peter has looked at this rich young ruler and he thought, well, this guy's got to get to heaven. I mean, look at him. He's got everything going for him. And because he's rich, because he's respected, because he follows God's commands, surely he'll get to heaven. Peter, on the other hand, he's not so, he's like the opposite. He's not so wealthy. He knows he's a sinner, but he knows that Jesus Christ is, Jesus is the Christ, the son of the living God. And this question of Peter, he is looking for some assurance from Jesus. Because in general terms, the poor were generally not seen as being able to get to heaven. But Jesus said what was impossible for man was possible for God. And of course, we understand that that applies to anyone. It doesn't matter if you're rich or poor. What's impossible for man is possible for God. But the question also goes back, Peter's question also goes back to something Jesus said to the rich young ruler. Jesus said, if you want to be perfect... Go sell your possessions and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Peter wants some assurance that etern of eternal life because they've left everything to follow Jesus. They've put all their hope, they've put all their trust in Jesus. But it seems that Peter wants to know what his treasure in heaven is going to be. He wants to know what is going to be there for him. 
Now, Jesus is very gracious to Peter and says, and I'm paraphrasing, don't worry, Peter. Don't worry. Whoever has left whatever for my sake will receive a hundred times as much and inherit eternal life. Now, there's a key phrase there, for my sake. Note that phrase. We're going to come back to that later on. Now, I think that response from Jesus would have made Peter and the rest of the disciples pretty happy. You know, they're going to be quite pleased with that answer. Yes. I'm going to get a hundred times more. Yes. If you get nothing, a hundred times more or nothing is nothing. But anyway, but they're going to get a hundred times more. So they're going to be pretty, they're pretty pleased with that answer. And then we read at the end of Matthew chapter 19 and verse 30, it says this, but many who are first will be last and many who are last will be first. And we may just have noticed that that's the same as how Jesus ended the parable that Ruthlin read to us earlier on. So there is something about this parable that Jesus wants to teach his disciples. There is something about what just happened with the children, what just happened with the rich young ruler, and the subsequent conversation that Jesus needs to make, make clear to his disciples. Jesus says the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out to um, hire, disciples, um, hire workers for his vineyard. Now, planting, maintaining, harvesting vineyards in first century Israel was strenuous work. It was hard physical labor in the heat of the summer. And often additional laborers had to be brought in to help all the work that get done. And the owner of this particular vineyard goes out at six o'clock in the morning to find workers for his vineyard. Yes, folks, believe it or not, people are actually up, dressed, and ready for work at six o'clock in the morning. Anyway, the owner of the vineyard offers a wage of one denarius. That's a soldier's pay for a day, and it's a generous wage. So the workers at six o'clock in the morning, when they heard they were going to get a denarius for the work, they were more than happy with that generous wage of a denarius. But as the day progressed, more workers get hired. And although specific wage is not mentioned, the landowner simply says that they will pay them whatever is right. And altogether, five groups of workers were hired. The last group hired just one hour before the end of the day. And when the time came for the wages to be paid, of course, we see that the first group of workers saw the last group of workers getting paid a denarius. So they thought, yes, we are bound to get more. And their anger was aroused against the landowner when they saw that everyone was being paid a denarius. Even though that's exactly what they had agreed upon when they started working at six o'clock in the morning. Now, clearly the landowner in this parable is the Lord. And Jesus wants everyone to come into his kingdom because the heart of the kingdom is the heart of the king. And the heart of the king is that all to come to repentance, all to receive this gift of salvation and the gift of God, which is eternal life. And on the face of it, you can see that God is a generous God. He's generous. Based on this parable, it doesn't matter if you come into the kingdom early on in life. It doesn't matter if you come into the kingdom late on in life. It doesn't matter if you come into the kingdom middle on in life. Not sure if that's really a term. But it doesn't matter when you come into the kingdom. The truth is, the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus. God is a generous God. He's generous. And of course, the best example we see of this is, the, is when Jesus is hanging on the cross. And there's two thieves crucified beside him. And one of the thieves recognizes that he's a sinner and Jesus is a savior and humbles himself before Jesus and said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And what were those words that Jesus said to him? Truly, I tell you, today you'll be with me in paradise. That's wonderful. What a wonderful truth. Though while people are still alive, there is still time for them to come 
to Jesus. As someone once said, if you're still breathing, God's not done with you yet. There's still time to receive the gift of God, which is eternal life. Because on the cross, Jesus paid the wages of sin. He took on our sin. He became sin for us. So that through his finished work on the cross, through his resurrection, we might receive the gift of God, which is eternal life through Christ Jesus. But in the parable, Jesus pays particular attention to those who were hired first. He says in verse 10, so when those, so when those came who were hired first, they expected to receive more. Now hold on a minute. Isn't that the same question that Peter asked? What will we get? What will be there for us? Peter was one of the first to come into the kingdom of God. He'd left everything to follow Jesus. To put it another way, what's in it for me? I'm putting everything into this. What can I get out of it? What's in it for me? You see, we can have a heart like Peter that's willingly giving up everything to follow Jesus. We can have a heart like Peter that's willing to give up our previous way of life so that we can follow Jesus. And that's good. That's really good. Because that's what Jesus calls us to. He calls us to be dead to sin and alive to God through Christ Jesus, to serve him because Christ sought us and called us and we responded to that call and we serve him and we work for him because he loved us and he gave himself for us. But sometimes when we've been working for a little bit of time in the kingdom, when we've been working in the vineyard for a period of time, then we can become sometimes a little bit like the Pharisees, we can come a little bit like uh, these workers who thought that their hard work, their faithful service, their righteous attitude, their adherence to the commands of Jesus would see them honoured in a way, way above anyone else. And while the first part of Peter's question was to be commended, the second part prompted this parable that Jesus said to warn Peter and to warn the other disciples and therefore us to be careful in our thinking. You see, Jesus is still addressing this subject of humility and service that he started talking about in chapter 18. He's still talking about that. And once again, the kingdom of heaven comes down to the condition of of our hearts. So in this parable, Jesus is giving a warning not to take our eyes off what is important because we can sometimes take our eyes off who we're working for. Who are we working for? Are we working for ourselves in terms of what we can gain for ourselves? Or are we working for the landowner? For his sake. And in telling this parable, Jesus is reminding us how generous a God our God is. Jesus is reminding us what a privilege it is to be serving in the vineyard of the landowner. Jesus is reminding us what that we are no greater than and no less than anyone else working in the vineyards. The important thing is that we are in the vineyard of the landowner. The important thing is that we are in the kingdom of God. Because Jesus called us and we responded to his call. And his gift to us in responding to that call, his promise to us is the gift of eternal life. Isn't that enough for us? Isn't that enough? Isn't that why we accepted Christ? Isn't that why we accepted him? So that he could forgive our sins? And so that we might know with a certainty where we go when we depart from this earth? 
And in the parable, when those workers took their eyes off what was most important, they began to grumble. Not grumble against their fellow workers, but grumble against the landowner. You see, Jesus is saying you have to be careful concerning the condition of your heart. You see, they were comparing themselves with other workers. And because they felt justified in their behavior concerning themselves, they were grumbling. They were grumbling against the fact that God is generous. Grumbling against the fact that God is generous. Their sense of what was right took precedence over the heart of God towards his children. And Jesus goes on to say that grumbling gives rise to becoming envious, envious of their fellow workers. And if we find ourselves in a place where we're comparing ourselves to a fellow worker, a brother or a sister in Christ, we may feel their behavior is maybe not as righteous as our own. Then in this parable, Jesus says we have to be careful we, because we're, we're grumbling against the generosity of God who simply calls each of us to do the same thing, to obey him, to be obedient to him, to be obedient to the work that he has called us to do in his vineyard, great or small. That work will be different for each of us, but it will be no greater than, it will be no less than anything else in the eyes of of Jesus because Paul reminds us of this in 1 Corinthians 12 where he says in verses 4 to 6 there are different kinds of gifts but the same spirit distributes them there are different kinds of service but the same Lord there are different kinds of working but in all of them and in everyone it is the same God at work he goes on to say as it is there are many parts but one body the eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you. The head cannot say to the feet, I don't need you. Now you are the body of Christ and each one of you is a part of it. A vital part of it. An important part of it. And God is generous in giving each of us different gifts. Giving each of us different forms of service. Giving each of us different ways of working but we're all important we're all equal because it all comes from the same Lord comes from the same spirit comes from the same generous God yes we have different roles but that doesn't mean that any of us are any greater than or any less than anyone else in the eyes of the landowner and that's why Jesus says at the end of the parable so the last will be first, and the first will be last. There is a level playing field. There's a level, an equality. And because um, when we're those, when we're those in the kingdom, when we are those who have been called by Jesus, and you know, we're not only in the kingdom, but we've been asked to work. We've responded to the call to work in the kingdom. <coughs> to work in the vineyard of the landowner. And that doesn't mean that we should grumble against the generosity of God towards our brother, fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. Because what takes our eyes, because that takes our eyes off Jesus. And when we take our eyes off Jesus, that means we're no longer working for him. We're working for ourselves. Or we're working for someone else. We have to keep our eyes on Jesus for his sake. We work for him. We work for the landowner. We work for him and him alone. And when we keep our eyes on Jesus, that makes sure that we're still working for him. When we take our eyes off Jesus, it's either then on ourselves or on someone else. And we're no longer working for Jesus. And we start to grumble. And we grumble against, not against our fellow workers, but we're grumbling against the generosity of God. Wow. 
are our eyes on Jesus this morning? Or are our eyes on ourselves or someone else wondering, what can I get out of this? So to bring this to conclusion, there's many ways in which this response, this parable is a response to Peter, um, and there's two key messages for this. The first key message is that it's never too late to come and work in the kingdom of God. Hallelujah. It's never too late to come into the kingdom of God. And Jesus is calling each of us, and the gift of God he offers us in his generous love is the same that he's offered across the generations is the gift of eternal life. It doesn't matter our age, it doesn't matter our status, it doesn't matter our stage in life, we can still respond to his call. And maybe this morning you're here and God is calling you. Maybe God is calling you and you feel him knocking at the door of your heart and he's saying, will you come and will you work for me? It's not too late, but we have to humble ourselves and say, Lord, I'll willingly give up my way of life in order to gain Christ, in order to gain eternal life. Be willing to say that I have this idea of who I am, but I'll willingly give that up in order to be who you call me to be. To say, Jesus, all for Jesus. It's never too late to respond to the call of the landowner to come and work in the vineyard and receive the gift of eternal life. The second key message is that once you're in the kingdom, there is important work for us to do. It's something that Jesus calls each of us to do. It's something different to what he asks someone else to do, but it doesn't make it any less valuable. And there's a warning that in doing that work, that we don't degrade the work of someone else. We don't become envious of what someone else is doing because in doing that we're grumbling against the generosity of God and giving to each as he wills. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 11 verse 3, you can hear his pastor's heart here, but I am afraid that just as Eve was deceived by the serpent's cunning, your minds may somehow be led astray from your sincere and pure devotion to Christ because that's who we're serving in the vineyard we're serving Jesus we're serving Christ and it's when our eyes are on him and not on ourselves and not on someone else that we're able to serve him out of a pure and sincere heart in devotion to him because when we love him we do what he asks us to do. What kind of worker are we this morning? Are we here thinking about what can I get out of it? Are we thinking I wish I had their job? Are we thinking nah, I'm better than them? What kind of worker are we this morning? How do we compare ourselves with others? Do we compare ourselves? with others. Jesus is saying, yes, we can all work, we can all become workers in the vineyard, but we have to be careful with the condition of our heart. We are there to work for Jesus and him alone. What kind of worker are you this morning? What kind of worker am I? Is my heart humble before him like a child? Is it serving only him? Because the gift that he gives me, eternal life, is enough. It's more than enough. And at the end of the day, he'll decide what reward a worker will receive. Not us. Let's bow our hearts in prayer, shall we? Father, once again, I want to thank you for your generous love. Father, a love that called us and brought us into your kingdom. Father, thank you for the gift that you give of eternal life. 
Father, it is more than enough. Lord, we're grateful that you called us. Thank you for the day that we responded to your call. And Father, I just pray that you would help us to keep our eyes on Jesus, to know that it is only you that we serve. And whatever it is, the reward is, Lord, it's sufficient. It's more than enough. Father, help us to not become proud or selfish to know what's in it for us, to take our eyes off Jesus. Father, help us to continually keep our eyes on you. For Lord, we don't want to grumble against your generosity. We don't want to become envious of our brothers and sisters, but when we keep our eyes on you, Father, I thank you that you are the one that just loves us and blesses us, that you are the one that we can serve, knowing that your reward and your pleasure and your glory are what's important. So, Father, help us keep our eyes on Jesus, and we pray this in his name. Amen. Mm -hmm.